Well, let's get into the sermon. <clears throat> I want to minister today for just a little bit of time, and I'm conscious of the time, but on the subject of the divine measuring of God's end time temple. There is a plumb line that has went forth in this hour. And I believe I can show you by the word of the Lord that God is measuring his church. And we are going and are experiencing his judgments with mercy, great mercy, until ultimately we measure up to the full measure of the stature of Christ. From Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. This is John who represents the end time apostolic anointing. He is an apostle of the Lord and he has this apostolic anointing and he's given this reed as a measuring rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. Three things. Measure the temple, the altar, and the worshipers. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. This message today is not to try to convince you or an establish an eschatology. I think we all can agree, despite our differences, and we have to allow those differences and differing views, because I do believe there is an element of mystery to the study of the end times. But I do believe, and I think we can all agree, that Jesus is coming again and will fully establish literally and fully the kingdom of God and the earth. And it's happening right now, and it's been happening for 2,000 years because Isaiah 9, I believe it's verse 7, it spoke of Jesus, and it said, of the increase of his government, there will be no end. So it's just going to keep escalating and growing <laughs> until ultimately it culminates in the second coming of Jesus Christ, the millennial kingdom reign, and the nations of the earth will receive him as Lord and King. And I thought Dr. Walnow did a great job last night, tremendous articulating so much of that truth. But the book of Revelation was given in approximately 96 A.D., and there's a reason why this temple that we're reading about here in Revelation chapter 11, I do not believe myself that it was referring to the earthly temple in the days of the ministry of Jesus. It can't be because that temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So this temple that John sees in the spirit around 96 AD in heaven, he sees this temple of the Lord. And I believe it's a picture of the heavenly temple. I believe it is the temple that when Moses went up to Mount Sinai, and I'll get to this in just a minute, but where he encountered the Lord, and the scripture tells us that we know he experienced so much glory in that encounter, his face shone bright, that he had to come down to address the people with a veil over his face. But while he was up in the mountain, the Lord told him when he went back to build the tabernacle, which the whole old covenant was built and focused and centered on all the activities, the dimensions, the measurement, and the specificities of the tabernacle, which of course later became the temple. But... Remember what the Lord said to Moses. He said, I want you to go back and I want you to build according to the pattern which I showed you in the mountain. The reason why Moses knew and spent 
you know, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the tabernacle plan, the tabernacle dimensions, the specific vessels and furniture in the tabernacle. He didn't just come up with that. He saw, I believe, this same heavenly temple that John saw in John chapter 11 in a spiritual encounter. I believe Moses saw that same one when he was caught up with the Lord on Mount Sinai and was told to build according to that pattern that he was shown. Now, I know many people have said that this is proof or evidence of a future Jewish temple. If there is, you know, I, I'm not going to debate. That's not the focus of my message today. I'm not for or against that. The point that I want to make is this, if this refers to another Jewish temple, a third temple, God will never again put his seal upon a physical building. God now dwells in human temples since the cross. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You were bought with a price and we all collectively are the building and the habitation of the Lord in the earth and when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, he begins the work on us to actually transform us into that temple with the exact measurements and dimension according to that divine measurement that he is asking for. The church is his temple now. The heavenly temple that John saw in John chapter 11, I believe, is a prophetic picture in the spirit realm, in heaven, a prophetic picture of God's temple in the earth, and that is you and I. It is a picture, I believe, of the church. I do believe that John is seeing a heavenly temple in heaven as a picture of the church, a prophetic picture. And as I alluded to in Exodus 25 and 40, this same spiritual temple is what Moses patterned the earthly tabernacle after. Now this is chapter 11. If we back up one chapter in chapter 10, we begin to see the unfolding of the seven sealed book. And there's a lot of debate about what that is and theologians have tried to understand the contents of that book. I believe the book of Daniel is part of of that book or the narrative of that book, but I also believe that seven sealed book is a prophetic picture of the heavenly blueprint for God's plan to unfold throughout the ages, through the church age. And that's what I believe on it. And of course, Jesus is the one that breaks the seals on that book. And when he does in chapter 10 of Revelation, John took the book and ate the book as he was commanded. And of course, you remember that the scripture said there in Revelation 10 that it was bitter to his belly, but sweet to the taste. And of course, this really is a picture of when God gives us revelation or reveals his will, sometimes it is hard to digest. Sometimes it is hard to process. And sometimes we taste and see the Lord is good, but then we swallow and it's bitter to the belly. But of course, the bitterness from eating this book, I think speaks to the developing and the maturing of the end time church because John wasn't told to drink milk, which is what a babe does. But those who have matured in Christ are given the ability because of growth and maturity to digest strong meat. And listen, we want to be a ministry for people of all levels of spiritual development. There's something here for the new believer, the babes in Christ, the adolescents in Christ, if you please. But what God is wanting in this hour and what has been the blight of, on the church, God's glorious church, there has been a blight over the number of years, and that is, it seems like, over the church age, there's been various setbacks at time, and instead of moving forward and multiplying and getting a double portion, 
one generation after the next, it almost seems like we have to have a genesis, so to speak, every few centuries. You know, the apostles in the first century, we see in the book of Acts the kind of supernatural they had. I really believe, let's just say there's 40 generations since then. I truly believe it was God's will and plan and desire all along for the church and the earth in the 21st century to be 40 times more powerful than even the book of Acts church because of double portion and the generational blessing like Paul gave to Timothy. And he said, you know, by the laying on of hands, he imparted spiritual gifts. And just like Elijah gave a double portion of his spirit to Elisha, Elisha is a picture of new covenant ministry. But it seems like that religious systems came in and replaced spiritual generations, spiritual inheritance passing from spiritual fathers to sons, and spiritual fathers were replaced by popes and cardinals and so on and so forth. Now I'm not belittling or trashing any other religious group. I'm just simply saying the kingdom of God was always meant to be a family, always meant to be relational, and always meant to be generational. This generation has to have something to impart to add on to the next generation, and that accumulates over the generations, and I think that is what we're going to see a grace a speeding up, an acceleration of time that this great last end time outpouring reformation is going to be a culmination of the anointing throughout the entire church age and it's going to fall upon this generation that is going to give us the grace to reform seven mountains, to reform our culture, to reform government and the arts and the church mountain, the media. I believe that this hour, there is a eating of the book that this end time apostolic ministry that John represents, there is revelation in that book that God has for this generation. It's not something new per se that goes against the word of God, written word of God. But I believe there are truths that God has revealed for this hour. In fact, I, I can prove it to you if you remember. The, the angel of the Lord told Daniel, he told him, he said, I want you to seal up the book. Look, there's that sealed book. The prophecy that was given to Daniel, he said, because the time is not at hand. But when John was given the revelation, if you remember, don't seal up the book because the time is at hand. And I believe we have seen a progressive historical fulfillment since the first century till now of the unfolding of this seven sealed book and redemption's story. And I believe it's only going to get better and brighter for those of us in the kingdom of God from this point forward and going forward. The path of the righteous gets brighter and brighter until the perfect day. And even though there is a narrative and a kingdom of darkness that is that is moving forward and going forward and seeming to gain acceleration and strength, I want you to know that there is another kingdom in this earth that is going to outdo, outgrow, outpace the kingdom of darkness. God's church is not weak. God's church is not defenseless. God's church is not going down. But God's church is going up in the things of God. We're not going back. We're not turning around. But Lord, this in time sealed book Help us to digest the revelation of the beauty of the history of the ages. And he was told, John was told once he ate the book, he was told something interesting. He said, after you digest it, I want you to take it. Somehow it changed his message. It changed the way he prophesied from that point going forward. What he devoured and what he ate as strong meat for the mature, for the apostolic ministry, what he ate there actually released to him a grace to prophesy a kingdom message to all nations, kindreds, and tongues. And that's what it says in Revelation chapter 10. He was told after he ate the book, 
to prophesy to nations, kindreds, and tongues. Thank you. And let me tell you what I believe this is. I believe what he is prophesying in Revelation 10 going forward. This is the gospel of the kingdom that Jesus spoke of and prophesied about in Matthew chapter 24. When he said these words, he says that the gospel of the kingdom must be preached as a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. I believe the gospel of the kingdom is, is, is something, it's a part of, but it goes beyond the gospel of salvation. The gospel of salvation is the entrance into the tabernacle, if you please, the temple. It's when you come to the brazen altar where death occurs and repentance and blood is shed and you go onto the washing laver where you are washed by the water of the word and washed in the waters of baptism. But I want you to know I believe that God is calling a company of people that are wanting to go beyond the outer court and say we're ready to eat the book. We are ready to eat the revelation that was reserved for this hour. The gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom paradigm, not just taking one of a city or one of a family, but taking cities and states and regions and nations to present to the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns. The gospel of the kingdom was a result of him eating the book and it gave him something to prophesy he hadn't yet. And as I said, John represents, I believe, the apostolic ministry that is commissioned and anointed to prophesy once they devour the word for their hour, the kingdom message. I'm not talking about something that's added on to the Bible. I'm saying the revelation of the kingdom, the gospel, the good news of the kingdom that goes beyond the gospel of salvation. And he's commissioned as end time apostolic ministry. I think John also represents those who have real relationship and intimacy with the Lord. Because it was at the Last Supper that John laid his head upon the chest of Jesus, the one, it said, whom Jesus loved. I think the reason why John had such revelation to give to us is because anytime you have your head that close to the heartbeat of God, you're going to have something revelatory. So John represents an apostolic ministry who has a real sincere relationship, an intimate relationship with the Lord. Number one, he's told to do a few things. He's commissioned to do a few things. Devour the book. Would to God that we would have people in this hour that really got a real desire to read the word of God, commit scripture to memorization, and to really get it down in your heart. His word, David said, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against him. There's something about devouring the word of God, digesting the word, getting it deep in you. Because here's the thing, you are what you eat. If you are always filled with fear and frustration and anger, it might be some of the stuff that you're watching on media or watching on television. And it is appealing to the base fallen nature of man. And you literally are what you eat and devour. But I believe God is raising up a company of people that are hungry for the word. They're interested in a charismatic experience that's more than just goosebumps and glory. Thank God for all of that. But we've got to be a people of spirit and truth. There seems to be two camps predominantly in the church now. Those who are all spirit and lack a whole lot of truth. And then there's a lot of people in the reformed community that have a lot of the truth of the word of God, but they're against the moving of the spirit. Would to God there'd be a company of people who would get hungry for the word like John did in Revelation 10 
And when they devoured that word, it produced a message in them to prepare the nations for the kingdom of God in its full manifestation. A message after he devoured that word to prophesy to all nations, kindred, tongue, and people. It was the kingdom message for a witness unto all nations. Once he ate the book, it changed what he prophesied. As I said, I believe the seven-sealed book contains Daniel's part of that. But here's what's interesting. If you, he, he eats the book in chapter 10 and begins to prophesy to all nations. Chapter 11, there's a measurement of the temple, the house of God, the heavenly temple, a picture of the church. And as you keep reading in Revelation, you're seeing an unfolding. Chapter 14, the angels of harvest are released to cast their sickle into the earth to bring in the great harvest. Chapter 15, we see a judgment that really begins to really accelerate on the Babylonian systems of this world. And we see that chapter 15 all the way to chapter 18. Something began to accelerate after that end time apostolic ministry began to devour the word and begin to get a kingdom message to begin to preach and prophesy and teach. Here's what it did. It released something into the spirit. It released something into the nations that began the ushering in of the great end time harvest and ultimately the kingdoms of this world coming down. And the kingdoms of this world becoming the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. The second thing he's told to do is to measure the temple, the altar, and the worshipers. He's actually told, he's given a rod, a reed, a rod, to begin to measure the temple. But not just the temple, but three things. Measure the temple. This is an apostolic anointing, by the way. A mature that can eat, not just drink milk, but eat the word, the meat of the word. He is entrusted with an apostolic anointing and mandate to measure the temple, measure the altar, and measure the worshipers. Now, let's talk about the first one, measuring the altar. I believe that I can prove of the two altars in the tabernacle that this is referring to measuring the golden altar of incense because this is mentioned specifically in Revelation chapter 8 in verse 3. It mentions the golden altar. Now, that is the golden altar of incense. Gold speaks of value. It, it speaks of something costly. It speaks of something of great worth. I think it was Bob Jones that used to talk about how that your senses, see, taste, smell, hear, and touch can become golden. And God can actually speak to you through your senses once they're consecrated to him. Well, getting back to this golden altar, I believe this altar in this heavenly temple is a prophetic picture of the ministry of end time prayer and intercession. We have more prayer going on in the earth right now than we ever have in human history. And Rick says this a lot, but it's so true and it's needed. Much of the praying is selfish praying. It's not praying kingdom principles. It's not praying his will to be done in earth as it is in heaven. It's a prayer about me, 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 and our, 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 our Santa Claus wish list of gimme, gimme, gimme God. Instead of figuring out, Lord, we're to pray your kingdom come, your will, your blueprint be done in earth like it is in heaven. We're responsible like Adam was originally given the responsibility, he failed. And that was to establish the rule and authority of God in earth as it was in heaven. We all know God rules heaven. But the scripture tells us that he gave the earth to the sons of men. Jesus came as the last Adam to do what Adam was told to do, which was take dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air. And of course, Jesus demonstrated that to us when... He turned water into wine. He walked on the water. He calmed the stormy seas. Take dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air. He caused 
coin, a coin to be able to come and fish his mouth to pay off one of his disciples' debt. Jesus showed us what Adam was put here to do. The first Adam failed and the last Adam fulfilled that mandate and being a child of God in the new covenant, a born again believer is about ruling and reigning with Christ in the earth, taking the original dominion mandate. And I'm not preaching dominionism, I'm preaching the word of God. That man was called to rule in the earth as God ruled in heaven because he gave the earth to the sons of men. The enemy took that rulership. He's now the little G, God of this world, the prince and power of the air. But here's the beautiful part at Calvary, at the cross, thank God for Calvary, Jesus dethroned Satan and soon he's gonna arrest Satan, give him his eviction notice, and the Lord is gonna show in the earth what it could have been all along if Adam would have just stepped up to the plate and did what man was created to do, and that is rule the earth with God. Take authority. You've been given it. Take authority, by the way. Your children are having night terrors and nightmares in the middle of the night. Don't you take that. Rise up as a parent, but ultimately as a child of God, you take dominion over the enemy. You put boundaries. Lord, build a wall of fire around our children so that the enemy can't play and torment their mind in the middle of the night. We have authority over COVID-19. I don't understand why it's not manifesting as much as we would like it to. I think I have some ideas, but here's what I do know. At the root of sickness is actually demons. And I think healing ministry is great and I think it's certainly for us. But I believe we'd get a lot of people healed if we understood our authority in deliverance. If sin is rooted in the spirit world, originated from the spirit world, so did sickness. And it wants to manifest in our bodies, perpetuate throughout our generations. But I think God is raising up a people to understand the dominion mandate given to the sons of men. And that is we have authority over sin and sickness. And ultimately, we are going to ultimately manifest as the, the full mature sons and daughters of God. And we're going to answer creation's groan and call. And we're going to stand up as the sons and daughters of God and manifest true sonship in the earth. Dr. Wild and I talked last night out of the book of Matthew about how when Jesus asked the question, whom do men say that I the son of man am? And of course, Peter answered, and we all know that verse, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Then Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Bar, Jonah, flesh and blood is not revealed it unto you, but my father which is in heaven. You are Peter, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You see, and Dr. Wall now mentioned this, at this place, at this particular mountain, there were statues erected to honor Pan and the demon goat god and false god, pagan gods. And I think it's interesting also at the Mount of Transfiguration, remember, and I, I talked about this last week, how that the Father said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. I don't think it's a coincidence that in Genesis 6, and I don't have time to get into this, I'm just trusting that you have some familiarity to what I'm talking about. If not, maybe some point we can talk about this. But where the sons of God mated with the daughters of men, and from that procreation came the Nephilim, the giants in the earth, And from that place originated the false sonship movement. Fallen angels trying to procreate with humans to create a distorted image of God in man. But Jesus, at the same place, at the same mountain, 
dedicated to, pan, to the, the false pagan god Pan, where the false sonship movement began, the father spoke at that same exact place where Genesis 6 picks up Mount Hermon. The father speaks from heaven and says on that same mountain, fast forward, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. I love it how God deals with the root. You know where he established the true sonship movement? Where the devil tried to introduce the false sonship movement. Anyway, I threw that in for free. So this measuring, I don't that's not in the notes. I don't know how I went there, but just follow on the Lord here. Measure the altar. This measuring of the end time ministry of prayer and intercession is being measured by a divine standard. Now I'm not talking when I say measurement or coming into the measure of the full stature of Christ. I'm not talking about legalism. See, legalism is actually obedience that is perverted. Legalism is the attempt to obey, much of it man-made stuff, Legalism is an attempt to earn something with God to qualify it as obedience, but it's actually legalism because the thought is if you do A, B, C, D, and E, you can finally get God's earning. Well, here's the thing. Jesus got that for you once you receive the Lord Jesus Christ and are born again. But when we talk about measuring, we're talking about maturing. We're talking about a divine standard, not a man-made one. And I believe this altar of intercession that he was told to measure, the apostolic ministry was anointed to measure as a mandate, that, by the way, was right in front of the veil entering into the Holy of Holies. The measuring reed is to measure the end-time church to come into the full measure of prayer and intercession in the last days. Mature prayer, not selfish prayer, but the church responding to the call and the invitation. As Dr. Walnow said beautifully, so much better than I could, said it last night, when you pray in other tongues, you are praying the will of the Spirit and tongues will make a way for you in the earth before you can actually get there. Praying in tongues of men and angels, not only that, but praying groans that can't be articulated or uttered. But the Spirit itself speaking through you, since we in our limited minds don't always know what to pray or how big to pray, when we pray in the Spirit, we pray in the Spirit, and the Spirit prays the blueprint of heaven into the earth. This is the measurement of prayer and intercession I'm talking about. Not selfish prayer, but the kind of prayer like John, who modeled intimacy, putting his head on the uh, chest of Jesus, a, an apostolic ministry anointed in the end time with an intercession anointing and mantle that comes out of intimacy with the Lord. So that ultimately, what we pray in his name, we'll get it every time. Because we'll be entrusted with it. Many people want, see this is why there's nine fruit for the nine gifts. Many people want the nine gifts of the Spirit, but don't get excited about talking about the nine fruit. You have the fruit to balance out the gifts. What good is it to have the gift of healing if you don't have the fruit of meekness and you talk about how great you are? See, gifted people without the fruit actually become dangerous. That's how cults form. But ultimately, since we're talking about measuring the prayer and intercession movement, the ultimate goal is for the ultimate prayer to get the ultimate answer. And that's the prayer of Jesus in the garden the night before his crucifixion in John 17. And it's a prayer, believe it or not, that Jesus prayed that has yet to been answered. And I think God is going to use this generation possibly to answer that prayer once and for all. And that prayer was this, Father, that they may be one. 
as you and I are one. You say, well, I think that prayer is answered. Well, tell the 2,500 denominations that can't even agree and unify over the things we agree on, but we divide over our differences. And this is the reason why whatever the figure that was given by uh, Dave Yarn, 70% of America that claims to be Christian, that's a majority. But unfortunately, a majority divided is less powerful than a minority united. You don't believe me? You know that only 4 to 5% of Americans, and I'm not bashing anybody, I'm just making a point. 4 to 5%, 4 or 5% of Americans claim to be LGBTQ. Only four or five percent. But yet four or five percent united changed the laws of our nation. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Redefine marriage. It just speaks to the fact when four or five percent are united. You know, here, here's the measurement for the prayer movement. Are you ready? Not to just be praying selfish prayers to benefit individuals, but I'm talking about the kind of praying that brings outpourings of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the very first new covenant outpouring of the Holy Spirit was in Acts chapter two. They were told to go to Jerusalem and wait and pray, pray until they're endued with power from on high. And we like quoting the part that says, and suddenly there came a sound. We want the suddenlies of God. We want the sound from heaven. We want everybody to be filled with the Holy Spirit and signs and wonders. But the part we overlook, we get that they prayed and they were told to tarry, but it also says they were in one accord. Would to God that the prayer of Jesus in John 17 would be answered. And that is praying that takes place from individuals and we're all praying the same thing in unity. If that brought the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit with just 120 praying in unity, what would happen if millions of spirit-filled believers begin to pray in unity with other believers? What an outpouring! That the prayer of Jesus in John 17 would be answered, that they may be one. See, the spirit of prayer is increasing in the church in this end time hour. There's a measuring time going on. Then he was told to measure the worshipers. The altar being measured was in an individual sense, your individual praying, seeking the Lord, understanding prayer is a partnership and we're not independent. We rely totally upon him. That's why we spend time with him. We love him. We want to know him. But it also... The altar being measured individually, but I believe in a corporate sense as well. Well, worship is also measured in a corporate and individual sense as well. Measuring up to the divine standard. What is this standard for measure the worshipers? John 4, 24. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. We got a lot of Christianity that knows how to worship, get their goosebump machine going. They know how to worship in spirit, but they're not so keen on truth that they get bored with that. Then we got a lot of Christianity that they're word-based, they have a lot of truth, but they're not open to the moving of the spirit. Could it be that the measurement the rod of God that he has put forth in this hour to ask us to pass under? Could it be that God is saying, I'm looking for true worship, not show, not a performance, but worship that is balanced equally in spirit and in truth? Yeah. Worship, our worship, individually and corporately, must measure up to that divine standard. He was told to measure the worshipers not by a man-made standard, by God's standard. Then the apostolic ministry represented by John is commissioned to measure the temple or the church, which is a picture. The temple here is a picture of the New Testament church. 
So the apostolic ministry is commissioned to measure the church, the temple, measure prayer and worship by divine standards so that we measure up. And John has the authority to do this because he represents the apostolic mature ministry. He ate the book, the seven sealed book, reserved for this hour, seal up Daniel the book. It's reserved for the time at the end. He devours that revelation of the gospel of the kingdom. It gives him an anointing to preach a message once he has consumed it and digested it. An end time prophetic message, I love this. An apostolic John preaches a prophetic message. The apostolic and the prophetic come together, watch out. That's what the church is built upon, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. So he eats this book as, the, as an end time apostolic minister with an apostolic anointing, with a prophetic message because he's devoured the word and he's called to measure the church and call in the harvest and culminate the judgment on the Babylonian system. What a mandate we have in this hour. What a, a mandate apostolic ministry has in this hour. To prophesy to preach the gospel of the kingdom so that the end will come, that ultimately the kingdoms of this world, Babylon is brought down once and for all, and the angels of harvest cast their sickle into the earth to bring in the harvest of souls. So number one, the church, the temple, must measure up to the word standard. The prayers of the saints as the incense that comes from the altar must measure up to the word standard. We got to measure up to what prayer, biblical prayer, a biblical church looks like. The saints as true worshipers must measure up to the divine standard, but John was told in Revelation 11, and of all the stuff you're measuring, that I've, by the way, if you actually read about the temple and the tabernacle, there were specific detailed measurements for every part of it. The holy place, the holy of holies, the altar. I mean, you can read in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. I mean, it is full of exact this many cubits, this far, this. The measurement of... There was a reason why in the Old Covenant tabernacle or temple, there were specific measurements. It had a prophetic message of measuring up to the divine standard. But he was told to not, to leave out the court and don't measure it. The outer court is distinguished from the temple itself. And this speaks to those in the outer court and they are left unmeasured because the outer court worshipers fail to measure up to the divine standard of the measuring rod that God is causing his temple to be measured by. They didn't measure up or qualify for priestly service, which takes place not in the outer court, but in the second dimension. Now, how many of you are familiar? We, you know, the tabernacle is a beautiful prophetic picture, and it's three specific areas. You got to go through the first to get to the second to get to the third. We've talked about this before, but I think it's worth mentioning again. The reason why the outer court was not measured in the outer court is the brazen altar and the laver of washing water, which speaks of a new believer. It speaks to 30-fold Christians. They've come to the altar. They've applied the blood from the brazen altar. They've laid down their life to take up his, and they've went on and been washed in baptism, and they've been washed by the water of the word. They're saved. I think this is also beautifully pictured in the three main feast days. Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. 
The outer court, I think, represents Passover Christians. Now listen, I am not minimizing salvation. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm talking to a prophetic, apostolic, mature church that is hungry to go beyond just entering in through the gate. Jesus is the gate. There was a gate to the outer court. There was a gate to the outer court, a door to the holy place, and a veil to the holy of holies. We're not talking, what we're talking about outer court, we're talking about the seeker sensitive stuff. We're not talking about just new believers. Everybody's got to be a new believer at some point. We're talking about saying, okay, I'm saved and I'm rejoicing. Thank God for Calvary. Thank God for the brazen altar and the blood shed there. Thank God for the washing I had in, in water baptism and the perpetual washing I had as I'm washed by the water of the word. But I want to go beyond just the gate in the outer court. I don't want to just be 30-fold. In fact, let's go on through the door. See, the gate, the door, and the veil are all pictures of Jesus just pictured differently. <clears throat> They're different facets of Jesus. We know Jesus is the gate to the sheepfold. We know he is the door. And the door that goes into the holy place, the second dimension, now hear this, in that second dimension or the holy place are the seven golden candlesticks which represent the seven spirits of God but also represents the seven churches in Revelation 1 through 3. Jesus actually said that. The seven candlestick, the menorah, represents the seven churches or complete church, the entire church. Then, of course, on the other side of the holy place, we have the table of showbread, which we'll get back to talking about priests feeding upon the bread of life. And then just as you're coming up to the veils, this intercession altar that we talked about measuring, the first thing measured, that leads to the veil into the holy of holies. <clears throat> now, the Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant is, which, by the way, the Ark of the Covenant is a prophetic picture of God's throne. Think about it. You got the mercy seat. What's the seat for? Someone to sit on. You got the cherubims on both ends of the Ark. The glory of God that fills that holy place. Not everybody enters there, or didn't anyway, have access. And I think that represents 30, 60, 100 fold. I think Passover, I think the second stage represents Pentecost, the outpouring of the Spirit, the sevenfold Spirit of God, bringing light and illumination for the priest to eat and to pray and to devour the bread and to have light. But I believe God is calling a company of overcomers to come into the Holy of Holies. Throne room encounters. See, now, there is a reason why. Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let, let, let's just back up just a minute, and I'm, I'm hurry along here. They didn't measure up for priestly service, the outer court people. And that's, by the way, the fullest part. That's where the most people are in the tabernacles, the outer court. They never spiritually advanced far enough in spiritual experience and growth to actually enter into the temple considered important enough to be measured. There is a divine standard of measurement that God, a plumb line revelation, a plumb line measurement in this hour to gather saints to come into the full stature of the measure of Christ as a temple company of overcomers. Might as well be you. To influence culture, influence what they're called to, to change nations to find their gifts and callings and be anointed by going to the top of whatever industry, whatever avenue, whatever mountain you're in, since Dr. Walnow's here, will mention about the mountains, and I think that's right. But it also points, the outer court, 
does to the non-overcomers. And who do they represent? The ones that aren't measured. I think it's those who stayed lukewarm back in chapter 3 in Laodicea and didn't respond to the open door into the holy place. Remember, Jesus talked about a door. If you'll open up, I'll come in and sup with him. The door was not to the outer court. The door was not to the holy place. The door was to the second dimension, coming out of just Passover-level Christianity into Pentecost, coming out of 30-fold into 60-fold. The door was to the holy place, the second room. And Jesus offered the Laodicean lukewarm believers an open door. If you'll open that door, and by the way, by the time we get to chapter 4 and verse 1 in Revelation, John said, I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. And a voice that sounded as a trumpet saying, come up hither. That's not the rapture calling us out of the world. That's the call, the voice of the Spirit and the bride calling, come. Come out of the outer court and come through the door into the holy place. Come out of introductory level Christianity as great as it is. And come in to the Holy Spirit where the anointing produces the flame from the sevenfold candlestick that gives us light to feed on the revelation of Christ at the table of showbread and teaches us intercession right before the veil into the holiest of holies. In John, Revelation 4, the door's open. He walks through the door, which is to the holy place. You see, the outer court speaks to those who stayed naked, lukewarm, blind, and deaf in Laodicea, and didn't heed the warnings. Jesus, all the seven churches, which represents the, by the seven golden candlesticks, right? I think that's where the church is right now. Most of the church, the charismatic, the Pentecostal church, is stuck in the second. The seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches. And I think these outer court Christians are the ones that never went any further. They never returned to their first love. They never overcame spiritual nakedness, blindness, deafness, or deadness. They never had heeded to the warning Jesus gave to the seven churches. He also applauded what they did right. But the Lord told John, he said, measure this, measure this, measure this, but don't measure the outer court. Leave them out. And that Greek word there, help me again, Nick. Ekbalo? Ekvalo. Thank you. It could also mean cast out, leave out, cast out. Like in Matthew 8 and 12 and 22, 1 through 4 and 24, 14 through 30. And same word as in Matthew 5, 13, chapter 1, verse 12, chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. The five wise, the five foolish. You see, that door that opened for John in Revelation 4, we don't read of it ever shutting. That means heavenly encounters, throne room encounters, going beyond the outer court level of a walk experience with God. The door is open to whosoever will, whosoever is thirsty. Come! If you want light, of the Holy Spirit, if you want to feed upon the table of showbread, if you want to go into the deeper things like intercession that leads to throne room encounters, you got to first come through the door. And by the way, that word door in Revelation 4 and 1, and I think it's also talked about in Revelation 5, could also be translated as portal or an access point. The invitation is to all of us. There is a door open just to the Laodicean in church. Whosoever will open the door, I'll come in and sup. The door that was open to John in Revelation 4 and 1 where he came up into the third heaven and encountered the Lord. 
and beheld the glory of the Lord. This is the door, not to the outer court, to the holy place. And it's actually mentioned in Exodus 26, verse 36 and 37. Here it is. You shall make a screen for the door of the tabernacle. Woven of blue, purple, scarlet thread, fine woven linen made by a weaver. And you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia wood, overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be gold. And you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them. Let me say it one more time. Remember this. There was a gate to the outer court, a door to the holy place, and a veil to the holiest of holies. Most Christians, as I said, are in the outer court of influence. Thirty-fold Christians, they stop at the brazen altar, the washing laver. And I think Sixty-fold Christians, they find the doorway to the third heaven encounters and a doorway to the Spirit and a doorway to the gifts of the Spirit, a doorway to the sevenfold Spirit represented by the seven golden candlesticks that brings light and illumination. And thank God for the light and illumination that we have as sixty-fold or Pentecostal-level believers. We were Passover-level, now we're Pentecostal. But there is a call to come beyond the veil. By the way, if you remember, the seven, as I said, the seven golden candlesticks represent the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3. And remember, in Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, John is standing before the glorified Christ. He's in the holy of holies of heaven. He's at the throne. Remember, that's the holy of holies. The ark represents the throne of God. And remember in Revelation 1, verses 12 and 13, John said this. He said, I turned and looked behind me, and I saw one like the Son of Man, standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. See, third room encounters, I'm sorry, third heaven encounters, throne room encounters are in the holy of holies beyond the veil. The veils in their soul have been torn and they stand in throne room encounters like John had, like Isaiah chapter 6. I saw the Lord high and lifted up his train, filled the temple. The angels cried one to another, holy, holy, holy. That is totally pictured in the Ark of the Covenant. The mercy seat, the cherubims crying one to another. That's what Isaiah saw. That's what John saw. That's what Moses saw on Mount Sinai. But John in Revelation 1 is standing in the Holy of Holies in the throne room before the Lord Jesus Christ and he turns behind him and he sees Jesus in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks or Jesus in the midst of his church. Where are the seven golden candlesticks? Not in the holy of holies. In the holy place where most of the church is stuck. The throne room in Revelation represents the holy of holies. The throne of God in the Ark of the Covenant. This is the heavenly tabernacle that John is told to measure in Revelation 11. By the way, the Holy of Holies thro throne room encounters, third heaven encounters, that's where Aaron's budding rod is that represents the miraculous. That's where the manna is that represents provision. That's where the Ten Commandments are. It represents the revealed word. You don't want to stay in the outer court and I say this often, but it's true. I, repeat, I just want to hear a preacher that'll preach to me on my level. If you get that, then you'll stay at your level. You say, well, they preach over my head. Well, that just means you need to grow some. <laughs> grow in your understanding. Devour the book. Eat the word. The door's open. Come out of the outer court. You say, well, I'd rather stay in the outer court. There's no measurement there. Listen, you want to experience God's judgment with mercy. 
Come in to the holy place. Get the light and get fed and learn about prayer and intercession and measure the altar and see and experience the sevenfold spirit of God. But I believe with all my heart, God is calling a company of people that will experience what John experienced at the very throne room. In Revelation chapter four, Revelation chapter five, what, when Moses built it, he built it as the Holy of Holies. When John saw it, he saw that throne, emerald throne with a rainbow round about the throne. He saw the 24 elders and the heavenly creatures. He went into the heavenly tabernacle, into the Holy of Holies of the heavenly tabernacle. And so can you, because within your very innermost being, as the temple of God, there's a throne on your heart. And you don't look outside yourself, but you look inside yourself to explore all that you can encounter and know with the Lord. Let's lift our hands and thank the Lord for the divine measurement of God in this hour of his church. I'll turn it back over to. Thank you for listening.